now tuned in to the Storm Tracker Podcast. Welcome back, family, to the Storm Tracker Podcast. I'm Marcus Benjamin, representing CanesCounty.com, part of the Rivals.com network. Make sure you you subscribe to this podcast on all platforms and also subscribe to this YouTube channel live from Canes County. Joining me today is John Garcia, Jr., National Recruiting Analyst from Rivals.com. Thank you for joining me today, John. Always a pleasure, my guy. Always, always. And, you know, you were at the UA All-America game uh, this past week, so we'll discuss that and also discuss the performances of, of Miami Hurricanes at the All-American Bowl as well. I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. But last night was the national championship game, and Miami is trying to get back to that game. I mean, it's it's been a long time. Maybe a lot of viewers who are watching this probably don't even remember the Hurricanes in that game. Uh, but it's true. It happened this century. Uh, but, you know, kind of watching that game, man, I, it it just made me feel like Miami could be back just because um, of what I saw in the trenches uh, from both teams, especially Michigan, uh, the of national champion. Um, so in, in your mind, with Miami's given recruiting classes, they pulled in in 20 and now 24. How soon do you think Miami can get back to that game? Well, look, I think Michigan is the right type of program to monitor relative to somebody getting back to the mountaintop because they're not the program that wins recruiting titles. They don't even win conference recruiting titles, you know, leading up to this point. It's been for them more about culture development. And like you said, the line of scrimmage, that's really been the calling card for Michigan, especially over the last three years when we've seen them get over the Ohio State hump and certainly the playoff hump this year. And, and I think that's where you start to see, especially with the future of the sport, an opportunity for a program to take one or multiple jumps up the college football tier system. Uh, I think that the timing is right for – Michigan to come out on top and another group of programs to start to challenge the Ohio States, the Bamas, the Georgias of the world, because we're going to get the 12 team playoff. We know the ACC path is going to be pretty clear within that playoff. And, and let's be honest, a road that might have less resistance than some of these other conferences, certainly the big 10 and the SEC and, and its new construction starting later this year. So I think all of those factors line up nicely for Miami. And yeah, you look at the trench halls, the 23 class is probably the best offensive line group in the country. And yeah. certainly January has showed us the 2024 defensive line hall at Miami, maybe the best in the country as well. So even to be in the conversation on both fronts, back-to-back -back classes, I think says a lot about uh, Mario Cristobal, not only taking this job, but sort of owning it it's not it wasn't just about keeping south floridians home it was really about reinforcing those trenches sort of sec style that's what wins and i think that's what won last night so all of those dominoes are lining up pretty nicely for miami which is a program on the field that is taking the necessary steps you know year one to year two now year three uh coming up i think the expectations will be that much higher and and rightfully so because a lot of these young guys saw the field pretty much day one yeah, you, you mentioned the college football playoff expanding to 12 teams. And I was having a discussion with uh, a couple of buddies of mine, um, actually at the uh, Pylon 7-on-7 seven seven tournament, which I was at last weekend. And uh, we were discussing which teams would, from the ACC, would uh, would make it uh, to, to the playoff. Do you think... Miami could be one of those teams. And how many teams do you think the ACC gets into this playoff next season? Hate to put you on the spot. I know we didn't discuss this before. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great question, right? Look, we've got – it's funky, right? First of all, we've got the power four now, right? That's uh, we're gonna, yeah. Are we going to call it the power four? I'm not sure. But in theory, power four conferences, RIP to the Pac-12 – you're going to have four champions, right? They're they're going to be in basically no matter what. 
Um, and then after that, all the at-large bids are going to be fascinating to sort. In theory, if you're going with 12 teams, you've got four power four champions and those runner ups are going to be, you know, very likely, whether it's regular season or conference title game, those runner ups are going to have heavy consideration. And then, you know, the group of five is going to have its say maybe for teams 11 and 12. So in my mind, there's 10 spots for the power four, if that makes sense. So, yeah, the goal, the goal of a conference championship is obviously still very important and that gets you in. But now being in striking distance can get you in. And I think that's where trajectory and style points are going to be big factors. And for teams that play better as the season rolls on, um, like we've seen with Miami at times in, in the last two seasons, I think those teams are going to get some of the benefit of the doubt. Now, obviously, injuries, quarterback play. I mean, there's still so many questions surrounding Miami. But again, this path in the ACC is going to be just a bit smoother going forward. We know the, the juggernaut that was Florida State in 2023, a lot of those guys are gone. I mean, just look at the bowl game, right? It's going to be a very different team. North Carolina, Drake May, most likely gone. They're going to be a very different team. Um, Louisville, a team that was maybe the surprise of the ACC this year that Miami nearly beat at the end of the season, going to be a very different team. I don't think Plummer has a 57th year of eligibility remaining. So I think all of the ACC Never factors know. at the top could change. So for Clemson, for Miami, for, for some of these programs that have the talent that maybe didn't show it in the win column, I think there's a massive opportunity to take a step forward. Absolutely. Uh, I guess we'll we'll see how it all plays out. I'm certainly excited to see a 12-team playoff. Even though this 14 playoff, I think they got it right. I think they got the right four teams in. Uh, the I think the two teams that made it to the championship team take championship game were the right uh, teams. Michigan is the rightful champion this season. Albeit, yeah, they did steal signs, and maybe they might vacate this win down the line. <laughs> uh, but we'll we'll see how that all unfolds but let's let's go to the ua all-america game Miami hurricanes had four representatives in this game are darius hayes jojo trader ryan mack and booker pickett overall your thoughts on the miami hurricanes at the ua all-american game just a great showing the, the during the week of practices certainly during the game itself you had to try to not notice some of these miami guys so i think you get both ends of it, right? Because I think going into it, you probably expected JoJo Trader to be pretty great. You had high expectations for uh, Darius Hayes. I think yeah. you know him and JoJo are ranked right next to each other as the highest ranked guys of the four. And then you had maybe question marks or a wait and see approach with Pickett and Mac. And I think we'll, we'll start with the, the latter too. The wait and see approach didn't have to wait long to find out the, the, the conclusion. Ryan Mack was incredibly consistent at corner all week long, covering JoJo Trader, covering Jeremiah McClellan, who's going to Oregon, covering Milan Graham, who's going to Ohio State. Some of the best receivers in the country all week long, we saw Ryan Mack lock up, for lack of a better term. Patience, consistency, technique, and a better twitch than maybe we were expecting throughout the week and then during the game he led all dbs with three pass breakups so there's a there's a rise to the occasion factor with ryan mack that i think goes beyond him being a smart corner versatile db you know 10 8 100 meter dash guy all that stuff is great but there's a certain competitiveness a quiet competitiveness that mack uh, has shown out in orlando that is, it, I'll just say it, it's going to result in, in a bump in the rankings. You know, we, we thought he was going to be a versatile sort of glue guy to the Miami secondary of the future. But I think now when you look at it, he looks like a guy who's going to contribute sooner rather than later, regardless of where you line him up. I think he can play nickel. I certainly think he can play corner. And he's smart enough to play safety. And I think that type of overall skill set physically and mentally is going to you know result in early playing time um and, and obviously you know st thomas aquinas kid he's 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 come up against the best and has always held his own he's just not the biggest fastest strongest flashiest corner that we're used to seeing in in south florida yeah. so he's he's slowly peeled that 
perception back and I think, you know, had as good a week individually as anybody there. And then with Pickett, again, we always knew lanky, freaky edge prospect that was going to beat offensive tackles with speed. That was a given. We 50 sacks the last two years. Nobody was worried about that element. It was really about everything else. How big was he? Could he work beyond the speed? And that's what Booker really showed. He wasn't just about that twitch. He has an inside rushing tool bag. He can use the spin. He can bound. He can cut inside. And he also showed up at 215 pounds, which I think was really important because I think in the summer when I saw him before his senior year, he was like 198. So he's clearly showed a, a dedication you know, to the weight room on top of it. You know, he's already six foot four, maybe even taller. He's got the frame, double Miami legacy. He's got the pedigree. I mean, heck, his uncle was a first rounder at Ohio State. The, the family pedigree is off the charts here. The high school production off the charts. It was just about how big did he show up and could he work inside against number one offensive tackle Jordan Seaton or 360 pound offensive tackle in Shaq McCroy, who's going to Oregon. And the answer was yes on all of those occasions. And he probably had the best game of any edge player as well. I think he had multiple sacks, uh, multiple yeah. tackles for loss. You just saw the flash with Pickett, and it wasn't just speed. So the intrigue there is has got to be sky high in terms of him making an impact early at Miami, especially if he continues to put on weight. If he can get to 225, 230, I really think it's going to be hard – situationally to keep Pickett off the field because he's got some natural pass rushing juice that you, you just can't teach, whether it's the first step or the moves thereafter, his bend, his redirection ability. It's like a wide receiver out there. So I think yeah. he's, he's one that made us look good. We, I think we've got him ranked highest of, of the industry, but we yeah. still might be too low on top of that. So I, I think yeah, he definitely. really made a statement and then look, Jojo was Jojo and Adarius was Adarius. Jojo, great route runner, great hands. You know, I think he's got the best hands maybe in the country at the wide receiver position. He showed off a lot of that. He stayed healthy, which I think was really important. You know, he didn't miss practices or anything like that. He was making plays day in, day out. Uh, and then Adarius Hayes, off ball backer, six foot four, impressive frame. We know he works really well downhill. So we were waiting a little bit to see him in action. And once we did see him in action, he was as advertised. Although a lot of people at Under Armour were curious, like, man, could this guy be another edge for Miami down the line with that great six foot four, 235 pound frame? So his position, I think, will be something fascinating from the moment he gets to Miami to the moment you know his college career and, and Coral Gables wraps up. But we well, love that evaluation. See? Where do you see him as? Uh, do you see him more as more as an inside backer from what you've seen? Or I, I know he's got like tremendous size, you know, uh, for you know his age. But uh, do you see him more of a, an edge outside or more of an inside guy? I could see him more as a Sam, a, a guy who's going to be aligned against you know starting tight ends who can work outside in uh, from depth at the second level you know I think that's where he's most comfortable now the the important thing here is that he looks like an edge rusher and he's open to moving you know typically these guys we see a little bit more on offense with guys who are maybe dual threat quarterbacks or their receivers and don't want to play DB we, we see a little bit more on offense but you know Adarius is not stuck to, to one position he prefers ba off ball backer he prefers to work downhill from depth uh, but he's open to putting his hand in the dirt or standing up on the edge on the outside. So I think he blends the two positions over his time at Miami. And he's another one, you know, again, six, four and a half, a ton of room to add mass, even though he's already 235. So that one can really go either way, depending on the, the mental aspect of how he picks up the defense and obviously the physical. I mean, if he gets to 250, 260, you're not going to see him off the football. It's just not common in today's college football and, and he's okay with that which i think is really important when you try to project a kid awesome awesome stuff on, on those guys really excited to see those guys on the next level when you talked about ryan mack it kind of reminded me of earl little jr you know he just really technically sound 
Uh, not the fastest guy, not the biggest or strongest guy, but just very, very technically sound. I, I think the ceiling for that guy could be like, you know, maybe like a sauce gardener because, you know, another very technically sound, not a super fast guy, not a super strong guy, but very technically sound when it comes to coverage. Uh, when it comes to JoJo, I mean, JoJo is JoJo, man. We've been seeing this for years from this kid, right? I mean, he just makes plays. He just makes plays. He knows how to find the football. He's just a natural football player uh, to me. And Booker Pickett, glad to hear that he could possibly get a bump because, I mean, from what we've seen, hey, maybe he could be, you know, on that five-star line. You know, who 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 knows? And then and Darius Hayes, what a, what a find, what a get uh, for the Hurricanes to flip him from Florida. Definitely an outstanding uh, find for uh, the Miami Hurricanes. Um, but when you look at these four guys before we, you know, talk about any, any other guys from the other uh, all-star game, um, could you compare these guys to any any pro guys in, in the NFL, starting with, starting with JoJo? Uh, like, what, what pro guy would you compare him to? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, he's got this combination of, like, natural ability and elite route running but then there's this there's this nat, there's this technical aspect and there's this natural aspect that he combines really well at the wide receiver position to the point where you could see him as a guy you just hand the ball to or throw a bubble screen to or one that you're you're working like multiple moves down the field to to create separation and he's got great top end speed as well so he really projects as a pretty complete wide receiver, especially in this day and age. But I think what separates JoJo on top of all of, of those compliments is the competitiveness. You know, we yeah. he has a nonchalant personality, but when he's on the field and he kind of gets going, he can flip a switch and he becomes incredibly competitive. And he reminds me a little bit in that aspect of Stefan Diggs because Okay. Again, not the biggest, not the fastest, not the strongest, but when he's when he's pissed off, he's really hard to beat, and he plays bigger. Like when when JoJo flips that switch, you think he's 6'2", 205, not you know six foot one eighty or whatever he truly is. And Stefan Diggs does that, and he's also a great technical route runner who's kind of known for great hands. So I think that that's where I see some of JoJo in his game at his best now. Is he as consistent as Stefan was in high school? No. Is he as um, technical today? Probably not. But in terms of the, the physical foundation and what he could be, I think that's the ceiling I see for him uh, at the next level if everything comes together. And he's probably a little bit bigger than Stefan, which I think is another important point. Love that comparison. Um, and let's let's go to Darius Hayes. I mean, uh, he's, he's, you know, a versatile linebacker. Um, what you want coming out of high school to kind of build upon, who, who would you say he compares to? Yeah, this one's probably outside the box for, for most of this audience, but there's not a lot of long linebackers like Hayes who can fill up the stat sheet. But I was covering the state of Alabama many years ago when this kid was coming out of high school, and I think he might still be the SEC's all-time leading tackler. He reminds me of Zach Cunningham, 6'3", 6'4", linebacker who's still in the NFL today who just wrecked shop. I mean, you looked at him and you're like, man, this guy should be coming off the weak side, killing a quarterback. But you look up and he's got 10 tackles. I mean, that's who Adarius reminds me of. And, and his mentality is like that of Zach's. But he's bigger coming out of high school. Zach was like 205. I mean, so I think that is where Adarius can be scary earlier in his career that he's already got this physical frame to play ACC ball today, right now, he can step in and compete from a physical standpoint. And that's just not something we say about a lot of high school seniors. So that's why we've got him ranked higher than, than just about everybody else and why we're so sky high on his future, because we could see him making an impact now and maybe making an impact at another position down the line. Zach Cunningham is a player that I actually um, picked up in fantasy. I, I, I do a ADP uh, fantasy football league, and he's a monster when it comes to tackling. 
So uh, that's how I, I got really familiar with him, um, you know, for the Houston Texans. So I know exactly what kind of player Darius Hayes can become. What about Booker Pickett, though? Because Booker Pickett seems like he might have the highest ceiling of the four. Who does he maybe compare to on the NFL level? Yeah, there's a lot of these twitchy edge guys to choose from. Obviously, that's it's a premium position. Everybody needs a, a complimentary pass rusher like a Booker Pickett. I, I look at a guy who maybe flashed as well as any player we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years, but maybe didn't hold on to that flash. But in terms of the talent, the body, and how crazy he was coming off the edge, I think Alden Smith. I mean, he he's the guy. I mean, go back to his college, go back to his rookie stuff, his early NFL stuff. This guy was unblockable because he was so long and strong. Tackles tried to get a head start against him, and he started to work inside and racked up a ton of sacks. I think he was like – the fastest a certain amount of sacks in NFL history, like 20 or 30 sacks, whatever it is. I and mean, he had an unbelievable start to his NFL career, a lot of problems after that. Um, but physically, that's who I think of when I when I see Booker Pickett because I just think there's just – pass rushing is an art, and you could argue that in this entire class, nobody understands the art of getting to QB1 like Booker Pickett Jr. does. And I think that alone – creates a ton of value he did it at a high level against great competition in tampa and then he's also shown us he can do it on a national stage um i mean he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with jordan seaton who's the runaway number one offensive tackle and they split reps you know and it wasn't just speed wins for booker i mean i think every canes fan should go back to the rivals youtube and check out those one-on-ones it was so impressive um you saw the twitch nobody got off the ball like booker did but then the tool bag after that in terms of what he could use to get to the quarterback was just as impressive as that first step in that natural athleticism. So he's really got it all to be that modern weak side pass rusher that that just freaks out offensive tackles, to be honest. Exciting stuff to hear, because I think the, the consensus when you saw – Booker Pickett at first, you're like, okay, well, this kid needs to put on some weight. He's get he's super fast. He can get around the edge, but will he be able to handle those monsters in, in front of him that he'll see on the next level? Now, obviously, Jordan Seaton is gonna be one of those type of guy that he'll he'll face. So it's really po positive to hear that he fared well against that type of talent. Lastly, let's talk a little about uh, Ryan Mack. I mean, I, I kind of alluded to what I thought he can be in the sauce Gardner, but what say you about Mac on the next, on the, on two levels up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to go more in the, you know, overall body of work direction here. It won't be a pure, you know, lockdown Darrell Revis get on the Island kind of corner. I, although technically I do love where, where Mac is from a, leverage perspective from a backpedal perspective from a trigger perspective knowing when to make his move i think ryan is is as advanced a corner as we've seen in south florida and in, in maybe several cycles i mean pat sertan was certainly the, the bar there um, but i do think technically ryan is is right there with him just from a leverage positioning phase and trigger standpoint obviously he's not you know not six two running ten seven or whatever pat uh, used to run. <clears throat> but I say all that to say that I really could see him as an elite nickel. I, I think he's a guy who you can work inside against these hard to deal with slot receivers that are big time in college football and even bigger time in the NFL and be one of these slot corners that that can rush the passer, can set the edge and be a true sub defender. But when it comes down to it, it's going to lock up a slot receiver or a, a pass catching running back out of the backfield with great technique, speed, and and triggering. So I think Mike Hilton, uh, I think he plays for the Bengals now. He's he's one of the top slot corners in the league. He was just known for living well in between the margins, despite not being the biggest, fastest, strongest guy out there. That's what I see in, in Ryan Mack. Now, it doesn't mean he's not going to be a corner, an outside guy. I think he can absolutely do it. 
Um, but I think his ceiling, especially when he puts on weight, because he's another one who's lighter, when he puts on weight and, and fulfills his physical potential, combined with that technical ability and his intellect and, and savvy, I really could see him as a guy you want working closer to the line of scrimmage to really piss people off, whether it's that slot receiver, that running back, even the quarterback toying with him pre-snap. You could see Ryan Mack being one of those those glue guys that that just makes plays wherever he lines up. And I think at his ceiling, he's going to be one of these underneath corners uh, that's just going to be a pest for for offenses. Great stuff from the UA All America game. Miami arguably had the best showing of all uh, teams having representatives in that game, but Miami also had representatives in the All American Bowl as well. And I, I know you were, you weren't uh, on hand for this one, but you know uh, you could kind of see the talent from this jump out of the screen from some of the players who who have signed to the U. One being Marquise Lightfoot. I mean, this guy really showed that he could be a top-notch player on the next level, similar to, to Booker Pickett and what he showed at the UA All-America game. And you also had pretty good performances from Anai Carr as well. He showed out uh, during the practices uh, during the week. Uh, Justin Scott was also a representative there, as well as Zaquan Patterson. Uh, just overall, what are your thoughts from those guys from that particular game and their potential uh, going forward with the U? Yeah, it's funny. I, I think the UA group was kind of the ceiling group. Like, hey, if A and B gets figured out, this is going to work out really well. I think the San Antonio group was like the floor group. Like, we know what we got in, in these <laughs> yeah. guys. You know, Zaquan Patterson is going to be a true – field general, a Buddha Baker, do whatever you need on that down kind of guy. Justin Scott is going to be a true modern interior defensive lineman. He can rush the passer. He can certainly stop the run uh, right at 300 pounds, strong, incredibly tough to deal with at sure. the point of attack. Marquise Lightfoot, like you said, ferocious off the edge, a little bit more physically built than a Booker Pickett. Um, but can still show some of those pass rushing traits off the edge and win with speed. You know, he, he's known for winning in a variety of ways, but he showed the speed showcase out in, in San Antonio. So the thought of one day Ruben Bain rotating with Booker Pickett, rotating with Marquise Lightfoot. I mean, right. guys like that. I mean, there's something to be said for production at that position. And, and I think Miami's set up to be very strong at that position here going forward. Uh, but we expected that from Lightfoot, you know, top 50 or so, you know, recruit uh, in this class. And then Nikar, again, you go to the production, one of the, the best receivers in the state of Georgia history, um, a Colquitt County high school record holder. For those who don't know, Colquitt County is like the Shaman on Madonna of, of Georgia high school football. Like they are maybe not the most well-known, but they're in that, you know, two, three, four category forever. Um, in terms of state championships and winning and, and history. Uh, so to be the number one guy at that school says a whole heck of a lot. Uh, competitive, great route runner, great speed, great hands, great ball tracking. And he, he reemphasized that throughout the week. So uh, awesome. I think that Texas group of, of Miami signees was high floor guys who, who backed it up. Hey, we had high opinions and we still do coming out of it. Awesome. Uh, now, with, with all these guys, you know, you guys are going through your evaluations uh, of these players. Uh, I think that's the one. I mean, there's many benefits for players going to these all-star games, but one of the added benefits is the fact that they could boost their rating or boost their ranking. Out of all of these players, which player do you think has the best opportunity to get a bump up in, in ranking or, or, or rating based on what you saw and what was seen in San Antonio. Yeah. Look, if we're talking rating stars, it's Ryan Mack. I mean, because I think of all of the, of those eight guys we just talked about, he's probably the one we are furthest off on relative to our, you know, junior year perception versus our senior year perception. You know, we we have him ranked as a safety 
because because we're we're thinking intellect well, say a lot of smart as well. right we're, we're thinking of of those traits more than the physical but the physical is there too you know so we'll we'll take the l on that one he's gonna move to corner in this final rankings update we actually have the first meeting tomorrow on, on this topic so we've been heavy uh, in the notebook so he's gonna move to corner and in terms of star rating, I mean, he's got a very good chance to to get that that blue chip status that he probably has long deserved. Um, but we'll catch up uh, here on the final update with Ryan Mack. Now, in terms of you know position and moving up the rankings relative to others at the position, definitely Booker Pickett has an opportunity to move up. Uh, he's a guy who's a top ten weak side edge rusher for us at Rivals, um, and and. Certainly, we look good in that standing, but he might be closer, you know, to that top half than that bottom half when when all is is said and done. So I think he's due uh, for a nice a step up the positional rankings there. You know, the other guys are pretty darn highly rated. You know, I think Hayes is like the number two inside linebacker. Um, Patterson's the number two safety. Carr's like a top ten receiver. Um, those guys, you know, it might be a spot or two, one direction or the other. Um, but sure. it, that was more about reinforcing reinforcing where they were. Same thing for for Justin Scott, who's you know a top ten recruit overall uh, yeah. at this time. So I think Mac and Pickett are the ones that you look for some some true movement with. But at the same time, those guys who are already sky high, you, you're not going to expect a huge move one way or the other for them. It was more validation of of the, the lofty rankings. Awesome stuff from John Garcia represents. Rivals.com, the national recruiting analyst for the Southeast region covering Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Thanks once again for joining me on this edition of the Storm Tracker Podcast. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on all platforms, the Storm Tracker Podcast, and also subscribe to the website, canescounty.com, for more exclusive information regarding Miami Hurricanes athletics. Also subscribe to this YouTube channel live from Canes County. Until the next episode.